Hi everyone, Elliot Jacobson here for Advanced Advantage Play. And the topic today I'm going to cover is how the pros crush casinos. Now, for a pro, there's a lot of different ways that they can think about doing this. But for people who don't know much about Advantage Play, they tend to think in terms of three ways that casinos, uh, people can walk into a casino and make a profit. One is blackjack card counting. One is playing poker and one is sports betting. And beyond that, pretty much everybody uh, agrees that when you play a game, you're there to lose. But for the pros, there are actually many, many more methods than this. And today I want to talk about uh, just a couple of those methods and how the pros can tell them apart. In other words, we are going to have situations where we have to take time to learn something. We have to learn a strategy. We have to uh, scout casinos. We have to figure out where these opportunities are available. And we have limited time. So we need a way of sort of measuring opportunities against each other. And that's what I want to talk about today in the full context of all advantage play pretty much against card games. We're not talking slots or poker or any or sports or anything like that. So, OK, here we go. The four methods we're going to talk about today are number one, card counting, but we're going to extend card counting from blackjack to blackjack side bets, bakra side bets, and indeed any game that is dealt from a shoe where multiple rounds are dealt between shuffles. Some of these new proprietary games have that kind of feature. Next is hole carding, and this is when you see a card that you weren't meant to see, whether it's a dealer's down card in blackjack or in three card poker, you see one of the dealer's three cards as they deal the cards themselves. We have information sharing. So these are situations where you might be sitting at a table and you, you show each other your cards. Um, this is quite common in blackjack, for example. In fact, blackjack's dealt face up in many instances. So anytime that you sort of aren't supposed to see other people's cards, but you share that information, that is uh, an opportunity for an edge. And the last is edge sorting, which of course, we know about Phil Ivey's case in Baccarat, but the method applies to many other games as well. So there are some mathematical concepts that all truly skilled advantage players know and understand. And so that's what I want to talk about today. The first is the basic concept of EV or expected value. What this is, is the expected win per round as a fraction of the wager. So um, advantage players tend to think in terms of making a wager size of one unit, whatever that happens to be. So what they are looking at is essentially how many units they're going to win per hand. So for example, if they have a 1% edge, they would expect to win 0 0.01 units per hand. That would be their EV. So EV is negative, of course, when the house has the edge. So what the advantage player is looking for is a situation with positive EV. In other words, they're expected to win money on average every hand. Now, if a person were to play N hands for some number N, we don't know what N is, but the way EV works is that if you play N hands, then your expected winnings should be N times your win on one hand. So for example, if you were to play 100 hands with a 1% edge, you would expect to win 100 times 1% or one unit after those 100 hands. So. The next concept is that of standard deviation. And we probably all learned about this somewhere in our high school or, or college uh, math courses. But what this number represents is volatility. So how rocky is the ride towards winning? So in particular, the smaller the standard deviation, then the less volatile the game is. And for example, a day job typically has standard deviation of zero. We always expect to get the same salary, the same wage, hour after hour, day after day. There's no volatility to that. Um, a lottery typically has the highest standard deviation of any gambling opportunity. We are taking a huge chance. We're probably going to lose. Um, uh, if you just consider the grand prize, we might lose 100 million times for every time we win. So if you play the same game 
n times. Again, we're going to look the same sort of thing with expected value, but now we're talking about standard deviation. So if you were to play the same game n times, then how the math works out is that the standard deviation for n times is the square root of n times the standard deviation for one time. So for example, if you were to play 100 rounds, then the standard deviation for those 100 rounds of the game will be 10 times the standard deviation as if you just played one round. All right, so it goes up by a square root. So expected value, if you play 100 times, remember that's 100 times the value for one hand. But standard deviation, if you play 100 hands, is 10 times is all. So important to keep those numbers in mind. Sort of the square root uh, feature is very important for standard deviation. So let me just remind you about this sort of normal curve, and this is very important for standard deviations. When you play a lot of rounds of a game, then you'll win some, you'll lose some, you'll have this volatility feature. And our expected value is right here at the center of this curve. So right at that 50-50 point, that's our expected value. Now, we will very rarely get that outcome. What we tend to get is a win or a loss, a big win, a big loss. We're going to be in one of these regions somewhat away from expected value. And the question is, what are the chances of being in these various regions? And so that's where this normal curve, this bell curve shape comes into play. So what we see here, for example, it's about a 34% chance of being one standard deviation above expectation, 34% chance of being one standard deviation below, and 13.5% for two above, two below, 2.35% for 3 above, 3 below. So this is kind of how these odds break down. And this normal curve is very important when we talk about analyzing uh, opportunities in a casino. So the next concept is the first sort of original concept to casino play that is not something sort of regurgitated from your uh, statistics course. And this is called the Desirability Index. And this was invented by Don Schlesinger. He wrote a very famous book, Blackjack Attack, which is either in his third or fourth edition right now. I highly recommend that book. Um, and this, the idea here is to measure the trade-off between win rate or expected value and volatility, or in other words, standard deviation. So what we really want here is the highest win rate and the lowest volatility, right? So the lower the volatility, if you think about it, great. That means that you don't have to endure these really severe ups and downs. The higher expected value, great, because um, it means that you're going to be winning more on average as a fraction of your wager size. So what we really like is a large EV and a small SD. And the way you make this work is by um, having this equation for the desirability index where you put the EV in the numerator and the standard deviation in the denominator. And if you think about it, what we want is a large EV so that the fraction gets larger. And we want a small standard deviation, and that also makes the fraction get larger. So both of those sort of contribute, right? Having a large EV helps the DI, having a small standard deviation helps make the DI larger. The final concept I want to talk about is, is one of these numbers that you almost will never hear anywhere outside of gambling. And this is called N0. N0 is the number of hands the advantage player has to play until the chances he is still losing after playing that many hands lies outside of the first standard deviation. So in other words, if you play N0 hands and you are still losing, then that means that you lost more than one standard deviation. If remember that bell curve, you are to the left of one standard deviation. Um, you're, you had a bad day, right? I mean, it, it can happen all the time, right? That's why we have a bell curve. So this, this does happen. But we would like to know how many hands do we have to play to sort of get um, an idea that we're going to be um, ahead, right, into the long run. So the number N0 gives an idea of how long the player will need to play to get to the long run. 
Well, it's not quite the long run because you still can be losing after that number of hands, but it's some number that we can sort of universally talk about. Um, the smaller the value of N0, the fewer hands it will theoretically take for the advantage player to beat the house, to have that sort of certainty that they will be ahead or should be ahead after that number of hands. And I'm not going to do the math on this, but it is not too complicated to show that the formula for N0 can once again be written in terms of the standard deviation and the expected value. It's simply SD divided by EV quantity squared. Now again, just so you really understand N0, we are talking about the number of hands that you need to play so that if you are still losing after that number of hands, then you have to be to the left of that red arrow and red line in the bell curve, right? So N0 says, hey, if I'm still losing, I was out there somewhere in, in bad luck land. Um, it has really no deeper meaning than this, but it is a sort of number that we use a lot in discussing um, different games. So what I have done here is to compile of, uh, some of these values for a variety of games for you to look at. First of all, on the top, I have ordinary blackjack um, two deck game, but we're gonna talk about the perfect card counter. Now I've analyzed perfect card counting, and for that game, the expected value is just shy of 2% um, per hand, standard deviation of 1.15. That comes out to a DI of 17 and an N0 of 3408, just over 3,400 hands. Now what is perfect card counting? Just as a reminder, that means you have a card counter who is sitting at a table counting they know every index, they never um, uh, make a mistake with their play, and the house simply doesn't care that they're a card counter, so they let the person uh, sit there, and whenever the card counter has a true count of plus one or higher, the person makes a wager of one unit, $100, whatever, and whenever they don't have the edge, they don't play, right? And I assume a two-deck game with roughly a cut card at very generous 75 hands. So in a very realistic way, Blackjack will never get better than this. This is an absolute upper limit on how good ordinary blackjack card counting can ever be. It can never be better than this. Actually, it's more typical for blackjack to have an N0 in the range of 30,000 to 50,000 hands. In other words, you typically, as a blackjack card counter, have to play 30,000 hands until you have an 84% chance of being ahead, right? That's how um, hard it is to count cards. On the other hand, if you look at blackjack hole carding, we just assume a typical game where we use lots of cover play and maybe we don't see every card. Then we get an expected value of about 8% over the house. Standard deviation slightly higher, but notice the DI comes out to over 66 and our N0 225. So if you are a hole carding blackjack, then you're roughly looking at about maybe three hours to four hours of play until you have uh, an 80, what was it, 84% chance of being ahead. So that is remarkably small. Now I have a bunch of other games here, so you notice that all the HC in this are all hole carding. So in particular, let me point out um, Mississippi Stud and we see, for example, that if you see the river card as a whole card in Mississippi Stud, that you have a DI of uh, over 87 and your N0 is only 130 hands. So just a couple hours until you're pretty much guaranteed to be ahead in Mississippi Stud. Three card poker whole carding, what I did a lot, um, is not that great of an opportunity compared to whole carding some of these others. So notice the DI of 20 and the N0 of 2501. Um, I do want to point out also collusion. We talked about this information, this card sharing opportunity. Notice the game High Card Flush has that um, DI of 25 and an N0 of 
um, close to 1600 so that is again a very strong opportunity in sharing cards to be able to get an edge there um, the pi gal poker dragon hand which is a side bet i don't want to get into the details also a very powerful opportunity but um, by far if you look at this of all the things that are available today, right? Of everything that's available today, you notice three card poker edge sorting, where you sort ace, king, queen in one direction, all the other cards in the other direction, has a DI of 101 and an N0 of 98. So really an hour, maybe two hours of a fully edge sorted three card poker game is the single best opportunity that I know about for um, an advantage player. Of course, all of these take a lot of work. You're not gonna just walk into a casino and be able to edge sort through three card poker game or be able to whole card uh, blackjack or some proprietary game, right? Casinos are aware of these opportunities and take actions to try and thwart um, advantage play. So I um, just posted an article, by the way, I want you to go visit my website advancedadvantageplay.com. So you see this article that's up there now, the desirability index of proprietary games. I go through these explanations in more detail there. So I hope that you will um, visit my website and uh, have a look at that article. And I've posted a few other things, so I'm, I'm trying to get that going again. Maybe you'll find it interesting just to visit. All right, everybody. So. One last shout out, and that's to my book here, which is available on Amazon. I am really hoping that if you don't have this book yet, you will go to Amazon and buy a copy. Um, it's really uh, selling very well. It's now nine years after its publication date. And when I go through this book, a lot of the material is still relevant today to a lot of games um, that you find in casinos. And finally, if you are on the casino side of this uh, casino surveillance or management, I just think that it's also important that you understand these mathematical concepts because when you put an opportunity out there that has a, a DI of 50 and an N0 of a couple hundred, yet you invest your resources into monitoring blackjack for ordinary blackjack card counting, I think you need to understand just how wayward the uh, expenses or the, um, you know, the money you spend on surveillance of blackjack is compared to the true risk that it represents. So, all right, everybody, that's all I have to say for today. This is Elliot Jacobson. See you later.